Alright, hello and welcome here to another YouTube video on the Netcode Guys YouTube channel in the series CS Inside. My name is Risk, and uh, yeah, this is going to be a video on the TSM player legacies, basically the history of, of the five players in the TSM line right now, and kind of where they come from, and, and what kind of history and teams they've had before the lineup they're in now. Also, do remember that uh, you can check out a bunch of more videos here on the YouTube channel for free, or you can sign up for uh, awesome awesome guides over at Netcode Guides you can uh, of course go to netcodeguides.com or you can just click uh, the link in the description below but uh, to get into the video the first player we're gonna start off with is, is basically the in-game leader the player that was lastly added to the lineup of course Carrigan and Carrigan is very interesting because he is probably the player that has been on a professional level for the longest time in TSM he has been playing CS for so many years. I think the first couple of teams where I started hearing about him was back in I wasn't even playing that seriously back in back in those days. I, I followed 1.6 on a very like far away level. I looked at the teams when they came to the lands where I was playing Source. He was in teams like Vault Gaming and Wusai if you guys remember those names and then later on uh, came into teams like SOA Full Gaming and then comes the interesting period with him because Apart from the Danish teams, the ones I all just mentioned and the ones he, he's going to go into in CSGO, he also had some periods where he played for the first part with Mouse Sports, um, with a, a full German team, so he basically knows German, he can call in German, he can play in German, and also stints with the Fnatic team uh, in those periods um, with some Swedish players in there. Um, and also in CSGO, they had a Norwegian, some Danes, and a Swedish guy in there. So very versatile in languages and in communication which is essential qualities for a good in-game leader just to give you an idea of, of why he's such a good leader of course he's in an all, all Danish lineup right now which means that he can really communicate on the highest highest level but he's so versatile he can communicate on pretty much any level level and his English is not bad either so I could kind of imagine like in in a weird uh, future another scenario where Carrigan just has a team of of the best players in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Germany, and just leads them because he's going to be capable of doing that. But um, he's been playing uh, the 1.6 scene for a while, and that's why he's he's the interesting character to start off with. And just the whole fact that he's been playing professionally adds something that the rest of the team really needs because they have some players in there. They have players like Device, Dupri, and Sipnix, who hasn't had that much experience with with pro level playing Cajun B. A little bit more, but not really that much either. But those three players, Sipnix, Dupree, and Device, are all kind of... Um, Dupree not as much, but Dupree and Device, very trolly players. They, they like to have a lot of fun, and the way they started was, was also just picking up the game for fun and not really taking it seriously. So that's why Carrigan is, is such a detrimental figure. And also why Fetish worked with this team as well before, because he's one of those guys who can, of course, he can have some fun himself, actually. Both of those guys, very funny, but can kind of crack down and do that in-game leadership or just out-game leadership as well like tell the guys okay now we focus now we do this and just communicate on that team level so yeah that was a short bit about Kerrigan's history Kerrigan is probably the easiest player to find stuff on that's why uh, the part about him, about him is not going to be very very long you can go check out Liquipedia you can check out HLTV they have a bunch of stuff over there so you probably you probably want to do that um, as well if you want to know more about him but yeah He's uh he he's been out there for a while. The next guy, um, is gonna be Dupree. Um, Dupree, of course, probably um, in my opinion, the player that has evolved the quickest. Um, because back in CS Source, all of these players have either played 1.6 or CS Source before they came over to CS:GO, and back in CS Source, Dupree was. Uh, sorry to say, he was next to nothing. Like he, he was of course young, so he didn't have that many years and that much experience. But the teams he was at, he was going to land tournaments. He wasn't winning, um, immenso stuff like that. Like low, low, low tier teams who of course did well went into the A bracket of the tournaments, but not really made any like big finishes. But it's actually really interesting with Dupree because he just exploded when CS:GO came out. There was the the couple of first like uh, seasons of CS:GO where he didn't really do much. I think he was on the um, he was on the 3D Max team with a couple of of Source Legacies guys like VNG, XLO, and Gravity. Gravity, uh, one of my favorite operas back in Source. 
but he was on that team just being picked up and kind of being coached um, by, by XLO, another in-game leader from the CSR in 1.6 days. But that was kind of like the first the first international signing of Dupree in CSGO. But then in 2013, he just, that, that, that was a beast of a year. He evolved so much in one year. He, he became, he went from being an okay player, being in decent teams in, CS, in CSGO, to becoming the best Danish player, in my opinion, in that year and a lot of years um, from that. So basically, he, he got into he got into the Copenhagen Wolves team. He won the Steel Series League, which is basically which was basically the uh, the Danish Counter Strike League. He had a bunch of international results, mostly of course uh, online matches. They did not win any lands, but they qualified for some uh, for some big tournaments, some dream hacks and stuff like that. And he really cemented his position as a top player in Denmark and and to really top that off that year um, the Danish side gaming.dk basically have had an award each year for like uh, we have top player and a uh, best opera best uh, uh, rifler and best in-game leader and stuff like that and he won uh, that player of the year award in 2013 and that is a player who has two years before that were not even on that list like not even on the top 10 so he's just exploded so much and, and that's why he's also really interesting in the future because if he can go from 2012 to 2015 to be going from being like a decent guy who just goes to some lands has some fun to being one of the best players in the world with the best team in the world what what will happen with him in three years from now when he has had even more time to develop himself a, as a pro gamer and as a as a player? So that's that's gonna be that's gonna be a crazy crazy thought, and and I'm really looking forward to that as well. So that's that's pretty much to pre. He's also yeah he's one of those guys that is he's been around the scene for a long time, um, but not in the top top level of it. I remember a bunch of tournaments were just like hanging around not really i didn't actually talk that much with the pre um but but just remember him being around and just being there he wasn't one of the guys that really like came out to drink and stuff like that but he he was always around he was always having fun um before being a part of that top team that he joined in in, in csgo with copenhagen wolves in 2013 which is i think my recollection of of what the first top team he joined um the next player of course uh we're gonna follow follow suit with um with with the source guys, uh, it's Cajun B, and he's actually interesting because he started out in 1.6, um, started playing in 1.6, started playing competitively in 1.6. Actually, also made a couple of teams. Surely went to a couple of lands. I have no recollections or history because pretty much the only Danish site that covered CS 1.6, Explain.com, went down, and their site is just ruined. There's no data whatsoever to catch up. That would be awesome for a video like this, but that site is just dead and no data on it. So pretty sad but from what I remember he switched over to CS Source um, and he got a lot of flack for the 1.6 just because back in the Source 1.6 days everyone in the Danish scene who went from from 1.6 to Source just got oh yeah you're just doing that because Source is an easier game you just want to win some money uh, at some LAN tournaments you don't really do it for the love of the game if you did it for the love of the game you would have stayed with 1.6 and stuff like that but he switched and he got that critique but I think that critique really fueled him because he got very, very good in very, very short amount of time. Of course, he had most of the understanding from 1.6. All he really had to do to adapt to was was the nades, the recoil. Um, but he had the understanding, uh, understanding of how to play CS at a top level, which was not the same. But yeah, you get you know you get what I mean. If if you know how to play, like how to move around on the map and stuff like that, you have to learn some new stuff. But you still have the understanding. Um, the team he got really good with in the beginning, uh, uh, according to my recollection, was a team called Hasta La Vista, which is um, a mix, a mix, mixed team tag who went up and down for a while in CSS. Uh, I think they were also on 1.6. Also had some other players on that team, guys like Hurden and Ruga, uh, in different uh, versions of that. So uh, a team that had, I think, I think they weren't that serious. I think they played around uh, much of the time. Um, but uh, yeah. But, uh, big talents on that team as well. And then moving on from that Hasta La Vista team, he played on a bunch of different top teams because Cajun B basically came out from 1.6 and pretty early, not like, I'm, I'm thinking 20, 2010, 29, uh, 2009, 2010, I think he came over to Source. I could be wrong here um, with a year or something, but 
he moved over and he got into some top teams and he played on some of the best teams that has been in Danish Counter Strike Source. Um, my favorite one, def definitely the CKRS team, um, together with also Fetish, the uh, the in game leader, and guys like Wants and 3K2. Um, that was a genius team. They actually were number two in the world for a long time. The only team they couldn't beat was Very Games, which back in CSOs was they were unbeatable. They had like a two year land win record where they didn't didn't lose anything. So being number two in the world was actually pretty significant back then. And also he was in the, the MTW international team where he played with a, a bunch of British players, including Weber from Easy Skins, who you probably know, um, where they actually eliminated very games from the last big CSORS uh, event in 2012 at Copenhagen Games. So KGB definitely has a lot of top level practice from CSORS, but not really the, the the pro player mentality that Kerrigan had because he played for, as a pro for such a long time in, in 1.6. But, uh, but yeah, also very interesting players who, who can also adapt to any kind of situation as with the MTW international lineup where, okay, he's not just on a team with Danish people. He's on a team with people who talk a different language, and he has to focus on doing his own thing, and he did that very well, uh, incredibly well, actually. He was just a stunning player because he was allowed to shine more on that MTW international team because of the aim of those players weren't as high as Caden B, so he just looked even better on that team. Um, not to take anything away from those guys. Those guys were, were incredible as well. So now there's two players left. Um, and I'm going to start off with, with the one I, I don't know that much about, and I think that's the case for pretty much everyone else, uh, which is Sipnix, or Sipex, as he, he he would like us to pronounce his name, but no one wants to do that anyway, so sucks to be you. Uh, <laughs> so Sipnix basically uh, comes from the 1.16 as well, but I did not know about him. Uh, I did not hear a lot about him. He, of course, was in the scene. He had some... He played obviously some some gathers and at some land tournaments but never in like a top top team like Kerrigan for example did um, the, the place where it kind of broke out of, of the whole being an unknown player um, internationally was at Northcon when CSGO came out Northcon in 2012 which was like in the first 10 CSGO tournaments of all time uh, he played with the with a team called C play uh, with another former 1.6 player called Ragin who switched over to source for a couple of years um, as a as an in-game leader and they actually played at that land tournament that was their breakout tournament I don't really remember who, who they beat some they had some like pretty high level results uh, and that was for a team who no one thought would do anything and he actually had an ace with a sawed off shotgun that was pretty amazing I'm gonna see if I can find that and put it over this video video or something oh, so you can see that oh, double kill with a shotgun Sipnix going absolutely mental with a sawed off shotgun Silver comes in with a headshot Ooh, Sipnix take this one the CT is on the defuse what's going on will Sipnix clutch it with a sawed off shotgun can he do it oh he can't it oh my god but that was kind of his breakout tournament and just after that tournament, um, he gets instantly snatched by the Fnatic lineup back then, who was um, almost a Danish lineup. They had Freeze, Trace, and then Madi, who's a Swedish but can understand Danish because he has a Danish girlfriend, and Stinger from Norway. Um, so he's been pretty much sticking with Freeze for a long time and playing with him because they like they didn't know each other that well, I can imagine, from, from 1.6, but they still they came from the same game, they heard of each other and stuff like that. So he stuck with Freeze for a while, even up to the Copenhagen uh, Wolves lineup who went to ESWC in 2013, where they actually they actually played out perfectly in the group and, and beat some of the top teams. They beat Very Games. I don't remember if they were called Very Games at Titan back then, but they beat them. Then they lost out to Astana Dragon, so went on to become Hell Racers in um, in the quarterfinals. But that was kind of kind of kind of his his little story before joining up with the team that became TSM, which is Team Dignitas back then, and then playing with with Fetish, who he also played with in in Copenhagen Wolves. Um, so interesting story with him as well, because he was kind of like he was he was not really that that famous, kind of kind of like Dupree as well. Like he didn't really do much stuff before. Yeah, before kind of CS:GO, and al also a big way into CS:GO, like a long time into that. So, yeah, it's it's always cool to see those those kind of breakout players like have one event, and then a top team realizes their potential and puts puts them on the spot, and just yeah rolls with it. And then that player just becomes good. 
And uh, that's also a, a good segue for the last player here, which is of course Device, as you all know. And Device started out probably in the youngest age that I've ever like heard about someone in, in, in CS, and that was back in CS Source. I think he started playing the game when he was around 12, like on a competitive level, not just picking it up and playing like casual FFA deathmatch stuff like that, but actually on a competitive level, sitting in the mumbles of entrilos, being on the sites, um, sitting in the IRC, IRC channels as we did back then, playing the gathers and all that stuff. Um, and he was just an online or a gather hero. He just played insanely well online. He had like, I think he had two accounts on the site people used back then to play gathers which was called Playseek or Spillerainen which were all in the top ranks of that side and he had just a bunch of different accounts he didn't care he just wrecked everyone online but he didn't take the game that seriously so whenever he went to a land tournament or whenever he started to go with a team it, it just didn't work out because he, he couldn't take the game seriously that's what I think and also he was um, trying to to really put a, a bunch of time in because he was a, a semi-professional badminton player. He actually went to a sports college to improve his badmin badminton career, and that was kind of the story of his career because it always went up. And then he was thinking, "Oh no, I got to go back to focusing on badminton because that's that's kind of like my second passion apart from CS:GO." And then it went down, and he was kind of like, "Oh, I can I can not play CS, so I'm picking up a team." And then he comes back to being amazing, and then once again, badminton strikes back. Hvad siger du? Hvad siger du? Hej, jeg hedder Weiss. Hvad siger Gamecast? Du siger Gamecast. Er nu? Hej, jeg hedder Weiss, og du siger Gamecast. Hala, hala, hala. Hala, hala, hala. Du er fucking sult. Hvad er det nu? Hej, jeg hedder Weiss, og du siger Gamecast. And I think it wasn't really before... I think he had an injury or something to his knee. I don't really remember the, the specifics of it, but he stopped uh, focusing on the badminton part for a while and then then it really really took off with him um, he, he went to the Copenhagen Wolves lineup in CSS that was his first big team I think um, I actually went with those guys to um, to a boot camp are you French? <laughs> Are you French? Hello! Hey! Du er Nicolas Und ich habe eine Potato Assassin Kan du høre mig? En Fjordort En Fjordort Train Okay, nu skal jeg høre dig Jeg skal høre dig, Det der er, I skal ikke skyde i jeg kører kort Hvem holder med? Hallo! Mæt! 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 <laughs> oh, I have some videos stuff that I'll, I'll put that over because he, that video also really shows like he's such a fun guy to be around and that's also why he works so well in the CSM lineup because they're first of all they're a bunch of trolls pretty much all of them uh, from a personal standpoint <laughs> uh, very very funny to be around constantly trolling constantly doing funny stuff and that's why I think they work so well together because they can have fun and then just if if you listen to the in-game communication they can have fun for like 30 minutes and then boom they go serious and then they just, just go dead serious for an entire bo5 maybe trolling a little bit in, in in that but they focus where they need to focus and that's that's the important thing as, as a team in csgo i think is to have fun with the game because it is a game you have to have fun with it or else you'll just like die uh, or your passion for it will die but also to be able to focus where you need to focus. And that's what I think Device has both started to do himself in the last couple of years and why he's become so good, but also because he's been with some in-game leaders who have been able to control that Kerrigan with his experience for all that time. And Fetish, the same thing. He has a lot of experience in CS Source, not the same volume, but he also has worked with players who were kind of trolly, just wanting to get around, shoot some headshots. A guy like Wants, for example. I think Wants is was the biggest talent in CS Source, maybe apart from Shox, but him and Shox were like the best players talent-wise, but once was just trolling, he didn't like CSGO when it came out, and the only guy who ever could control once and use him strategically in CSS was Fetish, because he knew exactly like what to tell him, and I think that's the same with Device sometimes, or in the beginning of CSGO, for example, he had to be told what to do, and then he would go and do that. I think now he can kind of more act on his own, because 
he knows himself better and he knows the game better and he's actually taking it serious. So yeah, that's kind of the video there. I hope you liked that little uh, information packet on the legacies, the histories of the TSM players uh, who are right now, I think, playing down at the PGL tournament. So yeah, do uh, make sure to, to go and follow them all and, and follow them in the games. And also do make sure to uh, go to netcodeguides.com if you're going to get uh, want to get to be a better player, if you want to learn more um, about the game and how to play it, what kind of smokes to put down, you can learn all that over at netcodeguides.com. But thank you for watching. My name is Risk, and I will see you in another video.